What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. We are here with another fire, 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 fire conversation. Really excited, you know, as we think about the rest of this year. Honestly, y'all, it's kind of crazy. The year is almost over, straight up. Like, we looking up, it's about to be September. You know what I mean? Then it's going to be Halloween. You know by the time Halloween comes, it's basically Thanksgiving. And by Thanksgiving, it's already Christmas. You know what I mean? <laughs> Christmas is New Year's. We're already in 2024, right? So I hope that, you know, you're doing well with progressing against your goals or frankly, coming to peace with the fact that maybe you didn't get as far as you wanted to, but hope that you found some rest somewhere in there, right? Like we get in these rhythms where we just feel like we just have to be producing, 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 and it creates stress and anxiety and unneeded guilt and shame because we're not producing at some clip that we've been conditioned or stressed into thinking that we need to. So I hope that even if you haven't necessarily like done everything you set out to do at the top of this year, that, you know, you're able to find, you've been able to find some rest. And now if you haven't progressing against your goals and you haven't found any rest, then yo, time for some introspection. You know what I mean? Which reminds me, if you haven't, make sure you check out the break room. Uh, the show is on season on hiatus. However, We still have dope content that y'all should go back and listen to about just wellness and rest. Honestly, another good show you should listen to, go back to, uh, by our own uh, Brittany uh, Janae Harris. Brittany Janae Harris is uh, Liberated Love Notes. Just some good content there, y'all. Like, straight up, go to living-corporate.com. You know what I'm saying? Make an account. Search wellness. Or click the links in the show notes. You know what I mean? Get, Get familiar that way. But just know, right, like Living Corporate, this is our flagship show, but we have other content that um, we've that we've been producing, right, that I'm excited that serves a variety of elements of like or a variety of dimensions. Aaron, clean this up. That serves multiple dimensions of the working professional, right? That serves m- multiple dimensions of being one of the marginalized at work and rest is critical in that. All that to be said, Aaron, clean up again. All that being said. I'm excited today about our conversation. You know, we we talk a lot about allyship on Living Corporate, and we don't always, like, define it like that. We don't always, like, name the term that way. But I was excited to finally sit down with someone who's actually been a supporter and promoter of Living Corporate for a while, okay? Um, and her name is Karen Caitlin. I was telling her on the show, like, you know, I, don't, I talked to a handful of Karens, the majority of Karens I know, I ain't going to I ain't gonna hold y'all, the majority of Karens I know be living up to the, the moniker, but Karen Caitlin is, is one of the good ones. <laughs> oh, Karen Caitlin is cool. Karen Caitlin is cool. Karen Caitlin is the founder of Better Allies. Uh, she has an extensive career uh, in executive leadership and management and now really focuses on uh, building uh, cultures and environments of allyship. And so... I'm excited that we're able to sit down with Karen. I love talking to members of the majority about ways that they see themselves in supporting historically marginalized people. Right. That's important. Right. To me. Right. Like it's important for me to. And I think for all of us to have and understand various perspectives and really like this work of workplace fairness and equity isn't going to move forward unless the white folks in charge actually make some cognitive changes and commitments as to how they're going to show up. It just, it's not going to happen any other way. So I love talking to uh, the folks who are, who are in the space aiming to do this work in a meaningful way, aiming to have authentic conversations and do and show up in these spaces in like tangible ways. And so I'm, Looking forward to y'all checking out this conversation uh, with Karen, Caitlin, and I. And um, and also, if you check out Better Allies, make sure you click the link in the show notes. And uh, we're going to pay some bills. We'll come back to you real quick. All right. See you soon. Karen, welcome to the show. Zach, it's a, such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, it's, it's a pleasure. You know, it's, it's crazy. I'm talking to somebody named Karen about allyship. I guess I have to ask, like, as a Karen, as a real life, you're, or you are, you are, you are, act, your name is actually Karen. How yes. have you felt about this, this Karen term? This feels very meta, but I want to ask. 
Yeah, so, you know, the root of the Karen term is some comedian who had a roommate who had a girlfriend named Karen, and she had all of the Karen traits. Um, it was part of his stand-up routine. That's where the root of this all happened. Um, and as it became a pseudonym for an entitled white woman, um, and yeah, just became part of our you know everyday conversation almost. Yeah. At first, at first, I'll admit I was a little like ticked off. Um, like, wh why did they have to choose my name for that? Um, and I was talking to my son, who's awesome and has so much empathy, and he's like, "Mom, I get it, but you have to realize that this phenomenon." is such a problem that it needs to have a quick term that you can just use that people understand what it is. Yeah. It's too bad it's your name, but it, this thing is so important. It needs to be called something. Um, you know, this I'll, I'll share with you a couple weeks ago, I met another Karen um, and we were talking about the name Karen and she said, well, why can't we just call it entitled white woman? Like, why do we need to have one word for it? So anyway, it's compli complicated, Zach. I'll just say how I feel about it. I, hey, I, I empathize. And, and yeah, I mean, there's something about it does. It rolls off the tongue well. But like to your point, though, like it also like it's tough when like, you know, there are people named Karen that are <laughs> that maybe not maybe aren't that don't fit into that model, that mode, mo mold. I'm trying um, to break. I'm trying to break that mode. You know what? That's a and that's a really healthy segue. Like, so, you know, you're I met I met you, became aware of you. I want to say I think you followed me on Twitter. Um but through your work with better allies and like your your prioritization to focus on on allyship and I, you know i think so much has happened and i feel this the dei space and the frankly the, even the employee experience space it goes through this these these cycles um it feels as if they the cycles are shortening and becoming much more aggressive um but especially after the murder of george floyd allyship became like this very like hot term that was used over and over like if you were to talk if you were to like give up your definition and how you describe and articulate allyship in your speaking and your writing like how how would you how would you define it yeah so first of all just for context i started doing this work on allyship initially through uh, gender. Um, it was only on gender. I was a woman, I was working in the tech industry. I'm a former vice president of engineering. And I was definitely a part of an underrepresented group working in tech. And I started doing this work to help basically the white guys that I knew were out there who wanted to be better, who cared about gender diversity, who just like, I just don't see it. I don't know what to do. I started providing them with examples, examples of notice when interruptions happen in a meeting and speak up and say something and redirect the conversation. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Hey, I just want to hear um, Annie finish what she was saying, you know, something simple like that. Um, look out for that office housework that women and especially women of color tend to be um, sh uh, shouldered with and you know, take your turn. Um, just like simple things, Zach, because I knew that there were men out there who did care about this and just didn't see it, didn't know it. That was my initial thing. I was tweeting from um, the, the Twitter handle Better Allies. And um, this goes back over, well, well, almost 10 years now I've been doing this work. Soon after I started through this lens of gender diversity and trying to help people see there were these simple everyday actions they could take to make sure that people could come to work and really thrive, um, it, I realized it's not just about women. Oh my gosh, if I think that you know there's all these gender issues, there's so many more issues that allies can be aware of and support. Um, so people now, I've really ex expanded my focus to people from any underrepresented group in the workplace. I am specifically focused on the workplace, not necessarily at society at large. Um, and so those underrepresented groups, as you know, are people of color, um, as well as other races and ethnicities. It's um, it's people who have disabilities, whether they're visible or not. It's people who are members of the LGBTQ plus community. It's people who are older or very young um, and um, making sure that we have workplaces that have that sense of belonging and inclusion so that everyone can do their best work.
and thrive. And the role of allies is to understand that just because you experience the workplace in a certain way, you have certain privilege that you should be aware of and realize that not everyone has that same privilege. Not everyone's experiencing the same work, the workplace in the same way that you are. And it's your role as an ally to use that position of privilege, to take some action, to do things, to make sure that again, everyone can do their best work. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I, and I want to, I want to go back to something you said. I, I have a follow up is like, at what point, what was your point of unlock to say, uh, I need to apply an intersectional lens to this concept of workplace allyship. And you say you really started on the concept of, of gender. How did yeah. you, how, what, what, what was the process to get to, to expand your funnel? Yeah. Um, so the way I started getting ideas for what I should be tweeting, um, uh, what things, everyday actions people could get, I got inspiration and ideas from social media. So listening and hearing about the experiences of people and always thinking like, okay, if I were in that room, what would I do? Um, so that was one thing. And I started just because I'm really active on social media, I was hearing about the experiences of black women, um, for example, or um, women, um, Asian women in America and so forth. So that started it. I also am a consumer of research, especially the social science research around this topic of inclusion and diversity. And I started just reading much more about the research and the intersectional work that people were doing. So I can't say there was any like one moment. It was more just starting to consume and become more um, aware myself of, of a, 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 my experience as a white woman is just one of the you know perspectives in this conversation. And I need to be more aware of what it's like to be members of other underrepresented groups. You know, it's interesting too, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, think about your background, like 25 plus years and like um, in engine, in the engineering and like in the engineering space, like as like in these senior leadership positions, I'm curious as you like, as you apply your learning now, like, is there any way that you would have shown up differently for black and brown people, black and brown women in those vice president positions, like b prior to better allies and like, and you being an instructor at Stanford, like, like, like this, this like super fire Karen, Caitlin, that I'm talking to now, like if you were to talk to like VP of engineering, Caitlin, like back in the day, like what things do you feel like, do you feel like could be applicable to you back then? Yeah, I kind of, yeah, you, know, you, you kind of wish and hope that you had, you had been perfect in the past. And I know I haven't been, you know, one thing, and I've written about this before, um, one thing I wish I had known was the um, the way that feedback differs for different people, that the people who are the most marginalized often get the least actionable feedback, that we, frankly, we all need actionable feedback so that we can learn from and grow in our careers and all that. Um, I did not know that the most marginalized people in the workplace get the least actionable feedback. There's research mm -hmm. about that now. If I had known about that as a VP, would I have been doing things to be more equitable in the feedback I gave to people and the reviews I was probably reading for the people who reported to me who were, you know, re reviewing people who reported to them? Um, mm. Yeah, I might have done something. Would I have been more aware of uh, making sure that I was looking at salary increases and the pay we were giving people through um a lens of underrepresentation. Sure, I should have been doing that, but that was not a conversation. That was not on the radar. I didn't. I didn't even know that was a thing. That there was not equal pay going on. I just didn't yeah. know. Yeah. And um, hopefully, people aren't listening to this and like, who, what? But, but you know, frankly, this this goes back like fifteen years now. I just the conversations were very different back then. No, a hundred percent, right? Like, and like, I'm just always so like. First of all, I appreciate your, I appreciate your willingness to share. Right? Like, I think about. I think about my own journey and like in my past and like just understanding like different identities, right? And appreciating um the lessons learned. And I think about to you, well, fifteen years ago I was fifty years ago I was I was eighteen. But <laughs> but a decade ago I was just starting my career. And so um I you know, I think about like how to show up differently and better now. And like to your point, like you, you know, looking back and being like, what well, could have done something differently? But I think there's, to your point about how you've shared those things, it's important and invaluable to people who are in those positions now and still don't know. 
So yeah. I think it's dope. Yeah, it's dope well, to thank be able you. To... Go yeah, ahead, do... sorry. No, it's all good. I was going to say it's, it's, it's dope to to be reflective and applicable like as you as a look forward for yourself and for others. I think I think my follow up is, you know, we think of, when we talk about like this intersection or um, um, intersectionality, like first, I, f- I feel like people like use that word, like they just kind of sprinkle it on everything. But like at this point, it's kind of lost its functional definition in terms of just like really, what is it? How does it work in, at work? But I would say as it pertains to like matters of, of gender allyship, like, you know, there's some complexity there when you intersect gender and race. And then certainly when you, and then when you intersect it again with like, uh, geography and uh, and um, sexuality, um, uh, sexual uh, identity. I think, like for me, I've I've struggled. I'll say, Karen, with like the idea of like, okay, yes, the like, yes, um, the patriarchy is well and alive. Um, a, that intersecting with like the reality of white supremacy, it's almost like like there there's the there's ways that different groups can be allies to one another right so as a black man i as a as certainly as a straight presenting black man i participate in the patriarchy and i benefit from the patriarchy in ways that uh that white women do not at the same time white women uh benefit from white supremacist systems and have certain privileges and access that i do not right and so like i'm curious like as you've like continued to like do your studies and things like how are you tackling like the real nuances of intersectional identity and allyship? I think like a lot of times it's framed as like a one way street, like had like what, what have, what have been like your findings or perspectives there? I found an incredibly helpful approach is to not even, not even use the word intersectional, um, but to identify the privileges we bring into life that we yeah. have simply because we are a member of a certain group. For me, it's a being a white person. I get certain privileges. For you, it's because of your male gender. You get certain privileges. But it's it's longer than that. It's more nuanced um, and sometimes complex, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, in my mm-hmm. books, I have um, I encourage people to think about the privilege they are bringing and whether that is a white man or a black queer woman there's still privileges that they each person might bring and i in my books i have these lists of 50 ways you might have privilege i have one for just the um i'll call it the the uh, standard workplace and better allies and then i also wrote a version of better allies for the healthcare workplaces and it's called belonging and healthcare and i took my list of 50 privileges and modified it for that setting yeah. but these list of 50 privileges yeah the first is the first privilege on both lists is you are white. The second is you are a man. Um, and so those are the top of the list. But then it goes yeah. into other things, such as you're able to practice your religion without taking paid time off vacation days, right? That's a privilege you get in our Western society if you are Christian and you can just take those days off. But if you are a member of another religion, those might not be uh, recognized corporate holidays, right? That's one. Another privilege is around financial. Like you actually have enough money in the bank yeah. that allows you to feel comfortable taking risks with your career, to sign up for that stretch assignment or that new um, unproven project that really might not go anywhere. You have the ability to take some risks because you got some money in the bank. You've got some financial security and not everyone feels that way. Um, and a lot of people might stay heads down and not take those risks as a result. So, the list goes on and on and on, but I try to have people really think about how they show up to the workplace with certain privileges and how not everyone is going to experience the workplace because they don't have those same privileges. So by the way, for people listening, and maybe if you have show notes, we can put this in there. These 50 ways you might have privilege are free downloads, um, no firewall or anything, no membership. You can just go to my website, betterallies.com and take a look at them and explore your own privilege. I love that. You know, you know, I think also like as we talk about as we talk about allyship and we talk about um it's like work uh, allyship for the workplace and helping and how allyship is leveraged to create uh, just a fairer work environment for everybody. You know, I was thinking about I remember you know, Karen like 
a long time ago, back in 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, you know, it was crazy outside. Like, white folks was apologizing, <laughs> handing out cookies, throwing money at black people, um, you know, confessing all sorts of very intimate things that I didn't ask to hear. I don't think we necessarily need to know all that. Uh, but what was interesting at the time was like, you know, there was all those, all the Black Lives Matter protests. And I recall talking about the idea of allyship being the willingness to like put oneself on the line for somebody else. Right. So um, there was like this really incredible image of like these white women and they like locked arms and like created like a body shield for the black protesters. And then like the police came and it was, you know, well, they didn't, they didn't hit the white women uh, a lot, uh, but they like threw some, they like, they were like, they were, they were definitely pushing them though. Right. But the point is, is those women put their bodies on the line. Like, I'm curious, like when you talk about allyship, like how much of that intersects with the concept of like power sharing or like giving up something. Right. Like, like when we talk, like when we, because in my mind, that's when I that's when I think like Alice Shipley hits the road is like, hey, what are you really willing to do and share and give as opposed to like putting a safety pin on your lapel or I don't know, like using a cute little hashtag. Like if you were to think about like what does practical allyship look like? What does that mean for you? Yeah, such a good question. So first of all, I um, th- the goal is to get to be an upstander. The upstander, the women you described um, in at that protest, I would say they were stand- they were upstanders. They weren't just standing by. They weren't just at the fringe, looked well, looking at this Black Lives Matters protest, but they were doing something, really physically in support. In the workplace, there are so many examples of an upstander. The upstander is the one who actually calls out the, you know, the boss or the grand boss when they use racist language or tell an offensive joke or make some reference. Um, and I hear from people who do this. Um, and there's a way to do it respectfully, even though it might be a level or two levels up. But that is taking a risk with your career because you're not comfortable with what just happened, because there was some non-inclusive behavior um, and you want to change that moving forward. Um, so many more examples in the workplace, of course, too, about being an upstander. But that's that's really, I would say, um, the most difficult archetype for an ally to have. Now, in my books, I have seven roles that allies can play or archetypes. Um, upstander is one of them. But the, I don't think you have to be an upstander to start this ally journey. I want people to get started doing something small if that's what it's going to take. So I think it's, I, I say one of the ups, one of the, um, let me change that. For example, one of the archetypes is the scholar. The scholar is someone who actually does the reading, follows the people on social media to understand the conversations. They are studying us. They're going to events to just listen and learn more about it. That's kind of an ally because once they have that information and are generally curious about the experience of other kinds of people that they're not like, they can start doing more. So I'm comfortable if people want to do that. I also have a role, um, for example, the amplifier. The amplifier is someone who's maybe in a virtual meeting and um, a black woman says something and they just add a hundred percent to what so and so just said in the chat. That's someone who's amplifying and adding credibility to someone in a moment. In the moment, um, amplifiers might also do things like, well, yeah, um, uh, let me tell you what I learned from Tanya about this topic, and they give Tanya a shout out by talking about something they learned from her in the meeting. Right. So that's another way that you can be an ally and take action. Um, and there's so many more examples, but Zach, back to your point, I don't think everyone needs to be an upstander mm. to start the ally journey. And I want to get more people realizing there's something I can be doing every day to be more inclusive. I can start creating a more inclusive culture. I don't have to worry about all of this complexity. I don't have to worry about um, making sure I get it right. I don't have to put myself or my career on the line if I don't feel comfortable doing it doing that, but there are other things I could be doing. Maybe that's in contrast to how you feel about it, but that's my approach um, to kind of hook people, reel them in and get them started. No, no, no. I mean, like, so, so first of all, I think uh, diversity of thought is real, even though it was created as this counter to like ethnic and gender diversity. Diversity of thought is, I think the, I think my, my perspective is that, and again, I sit somewhere different. 
right? So I sit as I've sat in the organizations, not as like a senior executive up and, you know, towards the end, I became a senior executive, but m- the majority of my career, I was a, a manager or an individual contributor um, who was like always on the margins or one of the onlys or really always desperate to like cling to and find some level of support. And so to that end, like, I, I de- like, I love how I love your framing of starting your journey, right? Because I would say they're starting your journey and then there's like showing up and actually like functioning as, um, as someone like really sharing something, right? Like, I think like one thing I said on, who was it? Oh yeah. My, my, uh, my, one of my friends, Lori Rudiman, our punk rock HR podcast, right? She was like, she was like, talk to me about like what it is like, you know, like if you were to tell people who are looking to be allies or like people who are trying to like do this thing, white people like me, you know, like Lori's like very, like very candid in that way. And anyway, and I said, you know, I said, one thing I would say is that like white people, like we don't need your advice. Like we need your things. Like we need, we need your, we need your access. We need your voice. We need your resources. We need your network. We need your ampli to your point. Like we need your amplification, right? And so, like, I'm not anti anything you've said. I don't know if I'm. I think that I think my 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 con- my addition to would be, I'm excited about the part of the ally journey that gets to you actually doing something, like to actually support other the lived experiences of other yeah. people, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. And and I think that can be day one. With some yeah. simple things. Yeah, give them to me. Okay, some simple things uh, that I haven't already mentioned. Yes. Um, uh, simple things. Um, so women of color are especially expected to do more of the housework in support of everybody else. Um, it's right. called uh, office housework, meeting housework, other things. Um Look out for that. If this, if there's like just a few women of color on your team, and they're yeah. always the ones expected, like, can you plan and collect money for the team? You know, one of our teammates is having a baby shower or the monthly birthday cake celebration or whatever it might be. Like, look out for that if that's going into onto their shoulders, and just offer to do it yourself. Like, sign up. Like, nice. that's like one thing. You yeah. Can do. Um, yeah. What's another? Uh, you can. Um, look at meeting invitations that you receive and just look at who's being invited. And if there's someone who's underrepresented who really should be in that room at that meeting and they're not yeah. on the list, speak up and say to the organizer, hey, I really think so-and-so should be here. Did you um, did you consider inviting them? Something like that. Um, you want me to keep going on? I mean, these keep, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Um, if you hear someone calling a you know, a, a young person, girl or kiddo or something demeaning that really emphasizes their youth and perhaps their inexperience and therefore their inability to contribute to whatever, just speak up. And this is going to be in my newsletter this week. Um, just speak up and say, ouch, did you really just say that? Um, if you are, and I did this recently, if you're in <laughs> talking to your pharmacist and the pharmacist says, "Hey, you really need to talk to your doctor and have him issue a, um, a re- you know, a renewal on their prescription." Speak up and say, "Yes, I'll talk to her and have her issue the mm-hmm. prescription renewal." Mm-hmm. Uh, notice these things that are happening that are just part of the the yeah I don't know the white supremacist patriarchy and and t- and say something, do something. Yeah. These are not the same. I don't think I don't think they're quite as scary as showing up at a Black Lives Matter protest and linking arms with other white women. For but sure. are they are they substantial to that person that you are supporting? Heck yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, hundred percent. I mean, and to your point, like I've been married for about a decade now. My wife tells me all the time it's the little things, right? The the little things actually are the big things. So one hundred percent, you know, I think I'm I'm and I'm I'm curious like in this season, like where, you know, like like I said before, there was like in 2020, it was free ice cream and streets were getting named after all these black folks. And uh, there were these huge multi-million dollar pledges over dozens of years. So the companies really didn't feel anything. Um, but now we're in a place where 
Um, and we really kind of saw like we saw a bit of a retreat, like retreat, probably about six, seven months into 20, you know, after after George Floyd's murder. But certainly now we're at a point now where organizations are. A lot of organizations are radically shifting, even how they talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, if they talk about it at all. We're seeing um, we're seeing political talking heads, you know, um, attack anything that would seem to provide any level of right sizing for historically marginalized, historically exploited people. Like it would seem to me that like there would be no better time or more appropriate time for your thought leadership on allyship than now. No, I would hope so. Uh, Here's, here's the, I'm so glad you brought up this topic. Um, So there are, as you pointed out, a lot of companies walking back on their commitments to this because of either customer pressure, um, political environment, uh, and and so forth. And uh, frankly, it's a trend. It's an easy trend to follow. When there's something that an executive team can say, hey, we're going to have a bad earnings um, report this quarter, we can tie it a little bit to that problem that we, you know, got called that target, Bud Light, whatever you want to be. Um, when one company does that, other companies can use the same excuse. It becomes an easy thing to talk about on Wall Street. This is why our earnings are low, right? So this is a convenient excuse right now people are using to walk back on the commitments they made previously. Okay. And those commitments, they probably didn't really make they were they were a lip service that they were making to this topic, right? Now right. I want to give credit. I just read yesterday a post by Lily Zeng on LinkedIn, and yeah. Lily called this out. Um, I feel like I'm almost quoting them as I'm talking, even though I'm not. Uh, I don't have their words right in front of me. But yeah. uh, I want to give a credit credit to Lily Zeng for really helping me think about that these the, the walkbacks that are happening right now are were were very shallow commitments to begin with. So, as your your point says, I I firmly believe it's like with and the affirmative action ruling uh, with higher education um, admissions. Right. So, um, one thing I think we need to be aware of as allies is know the facts. First of all, what's going on? The facts are that affirmative action ruling is just for higher ed admissions. It does not apply to everything in our lives. Okay, so that's the first thing we can still have diversity targets, diversity programs in our companies, okay? Because there's no law preventing that. So first of all, know your facts because the people who who don't want this stuff are going to be using affirmative action, um, uh, trying to apply it more broadly. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I think is we really need to double down on having more allies because the role of allies, this this doesn't take, doesn't have to be like a huge additional task on your to-do list. This is just how you should be showing up as a decent human being in the workplace and taking action using your position of power and privilege to make sure other people can have that same opportunity. And so I think we need allies now more than ever, definitely. And I firmly believe that any company culture, the ambassadors of that culture, the people who really make sure that culture happens are in the corners, are in the individual contributor roles, as well as the management roles, as well as the leadership roles. They are everywhere throughout the fabric of a, of a company. And if we want to have a culture of inclusion, we need allies throughout the fabric also who are making sure they are being that, that serving in that ambassador role for a more inclusive culture. Yeah, you know, and I so to your point, um, this this season, it's just it's tough, right? Like, like, like there's, and I, I, you're right. I think there's people looking for. First of all, you have to question like the authenticity of like those commitments in the first place. But then, yeah, like the people are looking for escape uh, excuses for for much more complex failures like that they are accountable for. They say, oh, it's because we did this thing over here. So you're scapegoating things out. Um, I, so I'm curious about like, I didn't, I grew up, I grew up, uh, I was born in Rome, Georgia, and I spent most of my life in Texas. But I lived in Minnesota for a little while coming up and 
I'm di- just I've lived in different contexts, and I don't know if I appreciated up until maybe I got to like my first year out of college how segregated our lives are, right? And like in talking to uh, my white colleagues throughout my career, like they would tell me things like, "Hey, like you're like the only black person that I talk to in my entire life." Like I don't, and I'm like, and and so and so for me, right? If someone like black and brown folks and certainly black folks have to, we don't have the privilege of being that insulated. So like, it's hard. It was hard for me to conceive. Like, so I said, so what do you mean? Like, you just say, I just, I don't see any black people. Like, and like over the weekend, I see no black people. When I leave this job, I see no black people. And I'm just like, I just can't. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. I guess I'm curious, like, as a part of this allyship journey (laughs) that you're just articulating is like. And, and 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 as much as you have maybe even examples for yourself is like what does it look like from your experience for white folks to actually like build relationship with and try to get to know black people not to say that all black folks want to get to know <laughs> you <laughs> right but no, but i'm curious yeah so i'll share with you so diversifying our network is a huge part of the ally journey because and there's social science research showing that white people tend to have mostly all white social networks, but black people, I think it's like many black people have all black or excuse me, 75% roughly of all mm-hmm. of black people have all black networks in America. Mm-hmm. And then Latinas and Latinos and Latinx, I should broaden it Latinx, almost half have all Latinx networks, social networks, friend networks, family networks. Mm-hmm. Um, so that translates, of course, into the workplace of who you tend to hang out with too, and who you have things in common with and so forth. So it is a problem. Now, Zach, I'll tell you, every time I give a keynote on allyship, I do start with diversifying your network and the importance of doing that, because I feel like it's just the, you know, it really is the baby step, because mm-hmm. how can we really have empathy and understand things if all we're if we're in that kind of um I don't know bubble of people just like us. So I start with it and every time I give one of my keynotes, I'm concerned like, oh my gosh, they're gonna tell me like I missed the mark because people like it's so it's too basic. Like it's too basic. Like they want more tangible things. I move on to more tangible things. But I always am concerned I'm gonna get that feedback, but I don't because I think people are like, yeah, I really need to do better on here. Um so just to let you know, I agree with you. That, um, and another thing I'll add is um, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who's our, um, uh, what's his, uh, Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy, he r- uh, issued a health warning recently, um, I think it was, that said basically, you know, because we actually aren't getting to know each other across our country, we are not getting to know our neighbors, the people people around us, that actually leads to public health problems as well as political problems. Um, yeah, um, kind of a big deal. So um, so that's, that's, I'll just throw that out there. I just had to bring that up. Now, what, what can we do? Uh, you know, what are some tangible, I call them baby steps, but they're really important as well. Yeah. So some things we can do to diversify our network. Um, I mean, literally say, send out a welcome email. Hey, let's get together for a coffee, virtual coffee to the next person who is black or brown or underrepresented who joins your team. Like actually yeah. do that, like simple, simple, but get to know them a little bit. Um, welcome them. Um, and a lot of people maybe just like are so busy, like oh, I'll get, them, get to know them at the team meeting or something. But no, how about them individual time? Um, we can also do things like attend events, ERG meetings, um, meetups, conferences for demographics in our industry that maybe we're not a part of, but we can see if we can attend as an ally just to listen and learn from the conversations, but of course, diversify our network as well. Now, in tech, there are so many of these, and a lot of them are virtual still because of the pandemic, but there's like lesbians who tech, Latinas in tech. Black Engineers Conference on Juneteenth every year. Um, mm-hmm. There are so many of these events that um, I try to go to some of them, um, again, mm-hmm. because I learn so much and anyway, and diversify my network. And what's another thing we can do? We can actually like volunteer for a nonprofit in our own community that might service and serve a marginalized group. Um, yeah. Not to say that I am perfect here, but one thing I've done recently, I, I, I'm on the board of a nonprofit that helps um, Latinx youth in primarily 
agricultural regions that surround Silicon Valley. It helps them with job coaching, some technical skill building and co-working space and networking so that they can get out, break the cycle of poverty, get um, hopefully on ramped into tech jobs. Um, so that's one example of me. And it's um, as a white woman, it feels really important to me to be doing this work because I know I've had so many privileges, especially in tech in Silicon Valley where I, I live. And I'll say, Zach, Silicon Valley is incredibly white with a little bit of brown mixed in. Um, it is. Uh, I do, when I go to the grocery store, it's rare yeah. that I see a black, a black person. I'll just tell yeah. you. Yeah. Rare. I'm telling you, I went to some years ago when I was consulting um, at, a, at a pretty large farm. Uh, but I went uh, to, it was, um, went to Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And I saw several brown folks. Yeah. Um, they were all in service positions, like not even waiters and waitresses. They were um they were doing a lot of the like the house cleaning in terms of like cause I, at, at the hotel. I honestly frankly saw them mostly at the hotel. Um and I it was very spooky. Like <laughs> like honestly, it was spooky. Like I remember, I was just looking. I was like, "Wow, it's so pretty out here." There are no black people out here. All the brown people are like doing service roles, like and not doing anything that's like client slash customer facing. Um, it just it felt it felt it felt spooky. So like so I, like I said, it was just as I got in my car, I was like, "Yo, this is just I, again like you're taught right, you're educated that segregation happened and." Um, and that, you know, I think that I didn't appreciate, it. and then my parents were telling me, "Hey, look, like we, you know, she, they would say it in different ways that we are still very segregated as a as a nation, as a as a as as American culture." Um, but to just see it that way, so 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 uh, nakedly, and I think the other piece is like to your point about like black communities, um, and like seventy five percent of them having like their social networks being uh, homogeneous. Um, racially homogeneous anyway, um, ethnically homogeneous, I would say is like, to your point, like, as I think back on my life, it's like, yeah, I had a handful of white friends and, and, and Latinx friends and some queer friends, but majority of my friend group has always been black. Most of my social network has always been black. Um, so, you know, that's, as so to your point, it's like, like, it's just kind of, as you take a step back, it's like, oh, okay, no, this is, this is applicable, right? That's like those numbers feel very real to me based on my lived experience. Uh, OK, so so look, Karen, I, I got to ask you, you know, we're in this landscape right now where. Again, executives are very, very, very flighty, very scared, um, some of them scapegoating, but I, I, I choose not to believe that everyone. In corporate America is some just bigoted. Misogynistic. Racist person. Like, I don't, I don't, at least I certainly don't think everyone is out here trying to just instinctively move like that. So for those who are like really genuinely trying to get on the journey to be an ally and also though, like as these times become increasingly dire for those on the margins, um, what advice would you give to them? Start somewhere. <laughs> Start somewhere. Realize that you do have a role to play and that one voice can make a difference. One voice, one person standing up, speaking out, um, giving a shout out, anything. It really can make a difference to the person in the room or not even in the room who is marginalized, who is otherwise being excluded from from something in their workplace. So get started somewhere. Um, and if you're not sure where, it's okay. Because I know it's hard to see what you don't even realize. You, you know, most of us with privilege don't even realize we have the privilege because it's just been part of what we how how we navigate life and how we navigate our careers and our workplace. Um, it's okay. That's why, and I'm not the only one doing this work, but there are a lot of us doing work around allyship. So do your reading. Um, there are so many books out there. There are podcasts. There are. Um, uh, newsletters. You know, I have this newsletter, Five Ally Actions, that I send out every Friday. A lot of it's like what I've learned about being a better ally because I'm on this journey too. I'm not done. I don't know it all and I'm still learning myself. So I try to share what I learn every week 
and the mistakes I make because I do make them. And I think that those become good cautionary tales for other people. Um, so I share what I learned, mistakes I make, and it's a good like regular reminder every Friday, here's a few more things to think about in the coming week of how you can show up to be a better ally. I love it. Karen, um, shout out to you, the work you're doing, shout out to Better Allies, to uh, to the to the statement you made earlier. Yes, the links are in the show notes, y'all, so make sure you click those, uh, you, you get that. Um, I appreciate you and see you're a friend of the show and um, we look forward to having you back. We definitely need to be thinking through and talking about this concept of allyship every single day. And uh, I love your point of advice to start somewhere and recognize you have a part to play because all of us have uh, relative privilege in something. Some of us ex- uh, exponentially more than others. And unless we all do that self-examination and then get to get to going, then we're not going to really change the world to work at all. So um, I appreciate you. I look forward to having you back soon. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. I'd love to come back anytime. Love it. Talk to you soon. And we are back. Yo, shout out to Karen Caitlin. Shout out to Better Allies. Make sure you click the link in the show notes. Make sure you slow down. Click the links in the show notes. Check out what we got going on. Let us know if you have any questions. You know, we want us to submit some uh, listener letters. We haven't done listener letters in a while, but if you want to submit a listener letter, make sure that you email info at living-corporate.com. Again, that's info at living-corporate.com. Or you know what? Email me directly. Zach at living-corporate.com. Zach at living-corporate.com. We'll make sure that we uh, we get those li- those listener letters in. Probably going to go ahead and make a type form, though, to be honest. That way people can just kind of like do it that way. That way you don't have to write a whole email. We can just put the listener letter in a form. That way you click it and then you go. Yes, we, we're going to do that moving forward. Make a mental note. Aaron, let's make sure. Okay, we got. All right. Um, let's see here. What else, y'all? Make sure that you're plugged in to our campaign, a series with Pfizer. Really excited about our series that we've been doing ongoing now for some years. I'm really excited about the last conversation that we had around intersectional identities, really looking forward to our next conversation. So make sure that you're plugged in so that you don't miss anything. And until next time, y'all it's been Zach. I love y'all peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.